Hello, my name is Carmen and welcome to my third floss tube video. So there are a number of new people here who were sent here on marching orders by the Laura Duet. So I have to extend a very warm welcome to all of the new people and of course to the returning people as well. And speaking of Laura Duet, I got like the most surprising shout out on a floss tube, one that I never even dreamed of. <laughs> and I mean, I'm sure many of you who are, you came because of Laura already know this, but yes, on Laura's floss tube that she has with Brenda, Brenda and the Serial Starter, uh, a couple weeks ago, I got a, a, a shout out, which was <laughs> so unexpected and amazing. So actually I was, uh, it was kind of a funny story how I found out, but I was on a bus and I was coming home from a concert that I had just played. So I'm on the bus with my cello and a music stand because they didn't have music stands at the venue. And you know, what do you do when you're on a bus with a couple minutes to kill? Well, you pull out your phone and you open Instagram. And I had a message from somebody who follows me, Wendy, who was like, hey, you just got a shout out by Laura Duet. And I was like, what, what do you mean? I, like I started kind of, I just, I didn't have, I was not in my environment and I didn't have enough time in that moment to, to fact check it. And I was like, no, are you serious? Is this real? And then I had to like get off the bus and I had all this stuff with me. Anyways, it was a moment of, of pure excitement, but also a little chaotic. <laughs> and then I got home, but I, I didn't have time to watch the floss tube because I had to go out to meet my boyfriend. So I just, I opened up the floss tube and I scrubbed through the video and Brenda and Laura do this really fun thing where they'll print out um, the names of the people that they want to give a shout out to. So I kind of scrubbed through the video and tried to find the moment where Cardamon Pins came up and I did find it and I just watched that little clip and then I, I ended up watching the whole video a uh, day or two later. <laughs> but anyways, Laura, you cheeky monkey. <laughs> Thank you for that shout out. Uh, I wish we could have been at the same week of Jacob Palooza, but Anyways, knowing you virtually is also wonderful. I can't believe that Brenda and Laura know who I am. It is, oh man, if I could go back a year and when I was discovering all of these floss tubers, cause I've been stitching for about a year uh, and also discovered floss tube about a year ago, I <laughs> would not have believed, I would not have believed that I would be uh, making a floss tube first of all, and that Brenda and Laura would know who I am and that I have all of these fun projects that I am working on. So, you know, it's been a fun year. So with that, I'm gonna get on with my with my floss too, but I just felt like I should start out by, you know, saying thank you to Laura and also welcoming all of the Brenda and Laura fans. Uh, Laura said that my floss tube is everything a floss tube should be. So no pressure. I hope I can live up to your expectations. I'll do my best. Anyways, let's move on. In my last video, I said that my next video would be a 2023 finish parade. And something you need to know about me now is that I'm a big fat liar. Uh, this will not be my 2023 finish parade. And the reason for that is because I looked at, at the videos that I'd already made and I realized that Carmen, you're a little bit long-winded. And uh, I figured that if I did all of the floss tube things that I want to do in a video and a finish parade, that my video would probably be like three plus hours long. So nobody wants that. I don't want to do that. You guys don't want to sit and watch somebody talk for, for as long as I already am probably going to talk for. Anyways, um, so I decided that I am going to split this video in two. I'm going to do my regular floss tube stuff. I'm going to show you all of my finishes from the last few weeks. Uh, there are, I've FFO'd several things, so that'll be fun to show. And I have a few whips that I've been working on. And I also have quite a lot of haul that I got in the last couple of weeks that I am really excited to show you, including a lot of floss and particularly a lot of pink floss. And I have some color combinations and comparisons that I want to do, which I find really fun. I really like talking about color. Um, and what else did I want to talk about? Oh yes, I'm announcing a sal. 
a little bit later in the video. It's something I've kind of hinted at in my last video. Uh, but yes, that is happening and I'll be sharing all the details about that a little later in the video. And lastly, because I do kind of want all of my videos to have a hook of sorts. So instead of my 2023 finish parade, I'm going to show you my fast, fast, my past finishes, not my fast finishes, but my past finishes from 2021 and 2022. Uh, and there aren't a whole lot of them. But I, I started seriously stitching at the end of last year. And for me, it's really fun to revisit these projects, even though a lot of them are things that I wouldn't necessarily be inclined to stitch now. They tell the story of how I got here and I have a lot of fondness for those pieces. So I'll show those at the end. And it's, you know, it's kind of a memento for myself in case I lose some of these things. A lot of the things that I made in the very beginning, I gifted. So I don't even have all of them to show, but I will include that in the end as a little amuse bush uh, and a little bit of a teaser for the next video, which will just be my 2023 finish parade, which I'm very looking, very much looking forward to filming. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna start with my finishes, which are also fully finished pieces. And I'll start with the big one, which is the Modern Folk Embroidery 2023 Stitch Along Reaching Skyward. And I have everything stacked up here, so. Okay, so here is my very finished, very much finished piece. This is the 2023 stitch along. Oh, I'm still getting used to looking at myself in this camera. Everything's like not mirror image. So I, if I wanna twist something this way, I actually have to twist it that way. Anyway, whatever. Uh, so yes, last time you saw this, I had just a bit of December stitching left to do. So since then I have fully finished the stitching, but I also, did a nice little hem stitch, which is something that I learned to do at the Jacob Palooza retreat. And I'll give you a little bit of a close up on part of the hem. Oh my goodness, I love doing a hem stitch so much. It is such a fun way of finishing things. And once you get the hang of it, it's really not that hard. And it's relaxing. And also, you know, it's a lot cheaper than getting something framed. <laughs> You know, it only costs uh, whatever the equivalent of a few lengths of thread costs. So uh, you may notice that the wall behind me is extremely naked. I don't have anything framed and that is simply because it's very expensive to frame things in a nice way. I know you can go to thrift stores and stuff, but I, I, I just haven't figured out like how to do that. Anyways, but this is how this is finished for now. And you can frame things that have been uh, that have been hem stitched. Uh, I've had a few people ask about that. Anyways, on my Instagram, and by the way, I invite you to follow me on Instagram if you're on Instagram. My Instagram handle is the same as my YouTube, which is cardamom pins. And I've been making uh, short videos that I've been sharing on my Instagram, which I will, I'll try to overlay it to this video too, in case you're not on Instagram. And I've been really enjoying myself doing that where I, I show like a little bit of my stitching and then pulling threads and doing the hem stitch. And uh, a lot of people have reached out to me about the hem stitch. And I've had actually quite a few people ask me to like do a tutorial. So I'm not gonna do that. I can't really do that because it's not my method to share. Uh, I talked about this in my previous videos, but in case you didn't see them, I went to a retreat a couple months ago, the Jacob Palooza retreat hosted by Evertote in London, Ontario. And at that retreat, I learned how to do the hem stitch. And this is uh, Jacob de Graaf's method of doing it. And it was part of the retreat experience and I'm really glad I learned that skill, but it's not really my method to share. So maybe one day Jacob will, will share that himself. Uh, but I, you know, it's, it, yeah, it's not my intellectual property. However, the good news is that there is a tutor tutorial on YouTube that I highly recommend uh, made by Krista West, who is the designer behind Avleia Folk Embroidery, 
which by the way just as a designer she's doing some really beautiful and interesting things she does a lot of uh, table runners like repeating patterns and I think a lot of her patterns are uh, inspired by Greek folk embroidery and I, I have a few of her patterns but I haven't actually stitched any of her stuff yet but I would really like to I think they would make such nice gifts anyways um so yes she has a video that she made a few years ago that I've watched a few times that teaches you how to do an open hem stitch that looks very very similar to this it is a different method uh, there are some steps that she has that Jacob doesn't have and vice versa but the final product is very similar so even though I don't think it would be appropriate for me to share how to do that it this way exactly uh, there is good news which is that there is a very comprehensive tutorial on YouTube already and I will link that video below as well as her website because I think she is worth visiting just as a designer even if you're not uh, interested in learning how to do the hem stitch but yes this is just the classic hem stitch and in a moment I'm going to show you something else that I fully finished recently where I also did a hem stitch but I did it in a slightly different way and yeah I love I've been having this just hanging on the back of a chair that I have over there and it's so fun to just like pick it up and look at it and look at my back and look at my front. <laughs> I'm really happy with this. The specs on this piece, uh, it is stitched two over two on 36 count Panettone by Roxy Floss. And the colors that I used are DMC Ecru and 924. And that is my finished piece. <laughs> And my biggest piece I think that I've ever finished. I have a bigger piece that I'm working on, but of things that are actually done, I'm pretty sure this is the most stitches. It's about 4,000 stitches a month for 12 months. So that means about 48,000 stitches. What do you know? Okay, so that's done. The second thing that I have fully finished, finished and fully, actually it's a start and a finish and a fully finish since my last video, is the 2022 uh, holiday countdown so uh ever tote with roxy floss and modern folk embroidery for the last two years and they are going to be doing this uh, again next year have done a mystery stitch along in the month of december and you can get the box with all of the flosses and every day you get a new floss uh, but I didn't do that last year because I, I mean, when, by the time I started cross-stitching, it was already sold out. Anyways, but the pattern is available and the pattern is called a Frisian band sampler. And on screen, I'm going to put a picture of somebody's uh, finished piece from the way that it was shown last year, uh, the way that it was meant to be stitched. And I just kind of want you to look side by side at my version versus theirs and just notice how different they are. <laughs> I've had a few people tell me uh, on Instagram that they didn't recognize this, even though they have themselves stitched it. And this is something I actually really wanted to talk about because it's something about cross stitching that I really enjoy. And that is kind of putting my own fingerprint on a design. So last year's version had 25 different colors in it because all 25 colors from the holiday countdown box were in it. And it was a band sampler that was split into two bands. So what I decided to do was to do it in one band and I chose my own color palette. I chose as well as my own linen. So this linen is 40 count um, Snickerdoodle by Roxy Floss and the flosses I used the red is tart, the green is sage, and the white, which is quite tone on tone, so maybe not as visible from far away. But yes, the, the white color is old lace, and those are all Roxy Floss colors. And I reordered, I, I changed the order of the bands to try and make it feel more balanced in, in the format that I decided to stitch it in. And it's something that I really enjoyed doing because I kind of allowed myself some agency and some creative license 
and I ended up taking something that already existed and transforming it in my own interpretation. So I mentioned uh, in the very beginning of the video that I had, I was on a bus with a cello and that's not just because I like carrying cellos around, it's because I am a cellist. I'm a musician, that's my job. And I, more specifically, I'm a classical musician. And as a classical musician, I don't very often create my own music that comes from me. Um, a lot of other kinds of musicians will do that, but I mostly, like 95, at least 95% of what I play is composed by composers who are not necessarily even alive anymore. I do quite a lot of pop stuff, so those people are generally still alive, but yeah, I am playing music that has been performed for hundreds of years, so I'm not creating a new thing every time I perform something, but I do have some creative license, which is in my interpretation of this existing work. And, you know, you can listen to two different musicians playing the exact same piece, and it might sound totally different, they might make totally different stylistic choices, one may choose to perform in a historically accurate way and somebody might have a more modern instrument or tuning or follow different traditions and so you know as a as an interpreter i don't necessarily create something from scratch but i am allowed to put my own twist on it and that's kind of how i see this i um in my first two videos i showed a finish of uh a sampler that I had made a conversion for where I changed the colors quite considerably. Um, that, what, that was the Garden of Holland uh, sampler for modern folk embroidery. And, and uh, yes, yeah, so what I really liked about that was that I, I felt a sense of ownership over it and I feel the same thing here. And speaking of hemstitches, going back to the hemstitch, I did a hemstitch on this as well, but I did it in a different way. And if you are familiar with a hem stitch, you know, you pull a few threads and then you, you know, you go through, you wrap another thread around to, you know, create the hem. And for this, I did two rows of holes. And it, with Jacob's method of doing a hem stitch, you go all the way around twice. Um, the first time you're catching threads on the inside to create those holes and then you fold the edges and then you go over it again. But because I did two rows of holes, I didn't go through the same hole in both layers. Anyways, it's a little hard to explain. But this is my finish, which I'm quite happy with. And I feel like this is a really nice finish for something that doesn't necessarily have a border because I sort of created my own border with this. Anyways, so this has also been on my chair. I've been putting it on top of this, kind of like this. And then I, you know pick it up every once in a while and look at it and ooh and ah over it. <laughs> Anyways, I wanted to mention uh, another, well, floss tuber and I get, I don't know how she would describe herself uh, because she does have a floss tube, but she's so much more than that. And this is Katie Strachan. And I have known about her for a while, but I only recently have I kind of gone down the Katie Strachan rabbit hole. I actually am considering going back to her first video and maybe watching them all from the beginning <laughs> because I've learned a lot through her videos. She does very informative videos and she's very creative and uh, very knowledgeable. Anyways, but she has been doing things like this. I mean, not it's not like this, but in the sense that she has taken a pattern that already exists and interpreted it in her own way. Recently she put out a kit of, I think it's called Cardinal Kin by Plum Street Samplers and I will put on screen the Plum Street version of it as well as her version and you may have already seen this on social media, it's kind of all the rage right now, but her conversion is with de silks and she's changed some colors and she talked about it extensively about why she chose certain colors and one of the cardinals is in a slightly different red and she explains why that subtle change creates interest and depth in the piece and you know the beads and 
and Katie's special touches on there and you look at that and you may be able to recognize that it is designed by, by Plum Street, but her voice is also in that finished piece. So she's somebody I find really inspiring and who I would like to emulate in a way, uh, not necessarily to create things that look just like hers, but to also create things where I can put my own twist on it. I think that that is something that we were, we are absolutely 100% allowed to do as stitchers. And actually, I think that that is kind of a very historically accurate way of stitching because there are plenty of samplers that, uh, like historical samplers that were copies of somebody else's and maybe they were a little bit different because, you know, somebody put their own name on it or they used different colors or they rearranged um, the motifs in a different way. You don't have to necessarily follow all of the directions and all of the colors that are offered to us. We are allowed to do what we want. I mean, you can stitch, stitch whatever you want, whatever way you want. Anyways, okay, so that's my second fully finished thing. My third fully finished is actually over here. One second. So the next thing that I fully finished is this. This is the Hanseatic Pin Pillow, also by Modern Folk Embroidery. So since coming back from this retreat, I've realized I've stitched nothing but modern folk embroidery. <laughs> and that is going to change. Not that I, you know, don't also love modern folk embroidery, but I think I need to spread the love <laughs> and stitch other people's stuff as well. But I've just, I've been on this roll of modern folk embroidery and I also, the, the whips that I already had were also modern folk embroidery. Anyways, whatever. Let's move on. This is the Hanseatic Pin Pillow. This is one that I've shown before. This stitching, I actually finished on this a couple months ago, but I just fully finished it the other day. And this is going to be a gift for my mom. So she turned 60 this year. So her year of birth, 1963, is on there. But yes, yeah, so this is stitched on an even weave 40 count in, it's called Mallow. I think I'm pretty sure it's Spygart. And I used one strand of DMC 3777. And just for comparison, this is the version that I stitched pretty much a year ago to the day. And this was my first modern folk embroidery pattern that I ever stitched. It was my first time stitching on linen, and it was my first time making a biscorning, or any kind of pin cushion for that matter. And I followed a YouTube video instruction that I'd found. Anyway, so on the bottom it says 2022 because that's the year I stitched it in. And yeah, it was stitched two over two on 32 count linen. So it's kind of interesting to see them side by side and actually see what the difference in size ends up being 40 count versus 32 count. And for the 32 count one, I used two strands of again, 3777. And I made this pin cushion for my mom because my mom has seen this one many times. And every time she sees it, she's like, oh, Carmen, I love that so much. Oh, what a great gift that would make. Carmen, ooh, like it's like it's dropping hints in the most obvious way possible. So, okay, she can stop nagging me to make one now because I made one. Okay, leave me alone, mom. Here's your pin cushion. Now stop hinting for one. Anyways, so I better win daughter of the year for this. So that's my third fully finished. And then my last fully finish is, I technically made this nine times, <laughs> but I'm only counting it as one. I showed this in my last video. For the last, um, for the last three years, I've made a little ornament for all of the cellists in my section in my orchestra. And this is what I designed and made this year. So I had to make nine of them. Eight of them have already been given away. Uh, we had our last day at work a couple of days ago, but I had one colleague who was sick. So I will be sending this in the mail and I held off on sending it to her because I wanted to show it on FlossTube. And in my last video, I talked about how I'd hoped to find like a thin velvet ribbon to put on it, but, and I got some really nice suggestions from people. Thank you so much. Uh, but in the end, I, I kind of just needed to finish it and I, I didn't really have time to source more material. So I just, you know, tied this thing in a knot, sewed it in in the back, and that's it. And yes, I left it naked in the back. Uh, this is the ornament they got. <laughs> Everyone was very happy. 
it's fun because our last show of the year is always some kind of a Christmas concert and so they all will hang it off of one of the pegs on the cellos and play the concert with the ornament hanging off of it. It's pretty cute. Anyways, so this is my last one. This is not stitching that I'm particularly excited about, but hey, I did finish it and you know, it's done. Done, no more candy canes to be stitched. So those are all my finishes. So now I'm gonna get into my whips and I have two. So the first one is the big one and this is the big Firlande. Oh, it's big. AKGIT, getting frame by, guess who designed it? Modern Folk Embroidery, because <laughs> apparently that's the only designer I stitch these days. Anyways, okay, here. Oh my goodness, yes. So since the last time that you saw this, if you've seen my other videos, I stitched this whole row of diamonds and, and some of the filler stuff. And those diamonds are so fun to stitch and so much easier to stitch than the trees. <laughs> oh my goodness. Actually, the next row of stitching I will have to do is again, trees. So I'm like a little bit nervous about that. <sighs> Anyways, the diamonds are by far way easier to stitch than the trees or any of the medallions. And I am, I'd say past the halfway point on that row of stitching and well past the halfway point on this sampler. I am stitching this on, what am I stitching this on? Yes, 46 count light hazelnut by XJU Designs. I love this linen a lot. And the floss I'm using is 993 by NPI. So I'm using a silk for that. And it is the most beautiful thing that I have ever laid my eyes on, which is maybe a weird thing to say, <laughs> but it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I could look at this all day long and it's just getting more and more gorgeous the more I get in here. And I said this in my last video, but I'm gonna be so sad when this is done. <sighs> I really like it. It's so pretty. And every time I look at it, I see more detail. I find there's a teeny tiny bit of back stitch in this middle diamond. I finished that last night. Anyways, so that's that whip. <sighs> so pretty, pretty. Okay, I ironed it. I ironed it just for you and for me. <laughs> and the other whip I have is the 2023 holiday countdown. So it's the this year's version of, of this project. And I didn't get the, the 25 flosses or the called for linen. I didn't get the whole box. I just got the pattern. And actually, I kind of want to maybe do this every year because I think it's fun to participate in something that lots of other people are participating in because you get kind of feel like you're all doing it together. But in doing it my own way with my own conversion, I don't feel like I'm stitching the exact same thing as everybody else. For me, it gives it a little bit more interest. And I chose the exact same, I used the exact same piece of linen with the same flosses that I used for last year's version. I was stitching them simultaneously and then I, I finished this one, but this one I'm stitching day by day, following the daily assignments, just with my own colors. And, you know, we've all been joking online about how this central motif looks like a lion. And yesterday we put in his sunglasses. <laughs> and, you know, I was joking online that I think he looks a bit like Zorro now. I mean, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are able to guess what that central motif actually is, turns out it actually might not be a lion. I do really like the idea of a Christmas lion though. And yeah, so I've stitched up to, what is it, the 19th today? So today's stitching were these little flowers, or not the flowers, sorry, the leaves, and also the leaves on these top motifs, which are tone on tone. I really like tone on tone. I know a lot of people are not a fan of that because it is, well, you don't really see it as well, but I like it because it forces you to, you know, it draws you in and, and you experience the sampler as a viewer differently when you're looking at it 
at different levels, like when you're close to it versus far away. And I don't know, kind of nice to have floss sink into the linen. It kind of feels like it all melts together. And I also find tone on tone doesn't look great when your work isn't finished yet. Once it is finished, I feel like it always kind of just comes together. Anyways, so I have been stitching this every day. The assignments are very reasonable. I like it and I'm very excited to see it finished. And surprise, surprise, I plan on doing a hem stitch on this one too. And I'm gonna try a different hem stitch that I've never tried before. And I think it's called a serpent hem, something like that. And it's kind of halfway between both of these hems. So I'm not pulling out two rows of threads, but when I do the first layer of wrapping around, I'll do it the same as I did the 2023 stitch along. And then I'm gonna grab like every other thread on the way back. Uh, I don't know how to explain this. <laughs> You'll see in my, maybe not my next video, but certainly whenever it is done, I'll show it and I'll try to explain it a little bit better if I'm able to, because explaining a hem stitch is really hard. You kind of have to see it. I don't know. Watch Krista's video. It's very, very good. It makes a lot of sense. I understood it completely. And I've already recommended it to a few people who said it was very excellent. So yes, Krista West, she's, she can help you. So those are my whips. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into my haul. And the first piece of haul or chunk of haul that I'm gonna talk about was from Evertote. So they are, I've mentioned them already like five times in this video. They are the exclusive seller of Roxy Floss linen and floss. And actually she's gonna start selling uh, finishing soon as well, which is super cool because that's one of my big goals for 2024 is I really like to learn how to finish things other than just a biscornu <laughs> and hem stitch. Like I'd like to know how to finish like a drum or I, I really like those, the mattress finishes and like needle books and stuff like that. I don't know. I, I don't have a sewing machine. I don't know how to sew other than really simple hand sewing. Anyway, so finishing supplies is something that I'm, I'm starting to think about. But anyways, I just got linen and floss. I'm actually going to start with the linen. So I have a project that I'm planning on starting uh, whenever I finish whenever I finish the 2023 countdown. So I guess on Christmas or the day after Christmas, um, or maybe a couple days earlier because I'm gonna be traveling. Anyways, whatever. So I got two pieces of linen that I wasn't sure which of the two I would use, but I am trying to build up my 46 count stash. I have a lot of 40 count, but I am learning that I really, really like stitching on 46. So the first piece that I got is catnap and I got an eighth of a yard. And this is great gray. Uh, it's a medium toned gray, not too dark, but certainly not a light colored linen either. And I think this is beautiful. I almost chose this as the linen that I would use for my project, but I didn't. I'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about that project. But yeah, this is a great linen. I've seen it. I saw it at the retreat. I don't know why I didn't buy it at the retreat. It's probably because I was busy buying other things. <laughs> But yes, this is a gorgeous linen. It doesn't have a whole lot of modeling on it. I like that it has these like little streaks. Kind of makes it look like marble or something. So that's catnap. And then the second linen I got, I don't know where this linen was hiding from. I did not know that they had this, but this is such a good color. It's called Biscuit. And I'm like, how did I not know this existed? So it's a beigey brown. This is like the an excellent sampler color. Quite neutral. It has, it's interesting because in some areas I can see like a little bit of a, a tealy undertone and then other areas I can see a little bit of an orange undertone, but it's very subtle. It's quite a consistent color. I'm, I don't know if this is a new release or not, but I really like it. And I got again, an eighth of a yard in 46 count. And I'm gonna be using this as the linen for my next start. Uh, so I'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about my plans. So those are the two linens that I got, catnap and biscuit. 
And then they had a promotion for a couple of days where if you bought a certain number of flosses, then you would get like 15% off or something like that. Anyway, so I wanted to enhance my stash and there were a couple of colors that I wanted to get anyways that were also on part of this promotional sale. So I got quite a lot of floss. I'm not gonna show all of it, but I was playing around last night with them and I ended up coming up, coming up with a bunch of color combinations that I think are really interesting. And I know that a lot of people are planning to do the modern folk embroidery stitch along for 2024. And so I thought, hey, why don't I, uh, why don't I show some of these fun color combinations and people might be interested in, in them for something, or maybe it just gives you a little bit of, of inspiration. I love talking about color. I'm not an expert in color theory, but I'd like to know more. Is there like a book or something that somebody can recommend about color theory? I think it's fascinating. I, I anyways, I, I love looking at color and thinking what other colors are in that color. Anyway, so, so yes, last night I ended up coming up with 10 different color combinations that I think look really flattering, which you could use for all sorts of projects. Um, Modern folk embroidery has a lot of designs that are can be stitched monochromatic or with two colors um, or things that are maybe monochromatic but you can do them in multiple colors if you want to and another designer that it lends well to that kind of thinking when it comes to choosing colors would be long dog samplers. I've never actually stitched any of their pieces and then there are also a number of other especially smalls. I've seen a lot of smalls that are stitched monochromatic and maybe you aren't uh, as into the colors that are suggested or you don't have them in stash. And anyways, so this is an, an example of, you know, how you can interpret things in your own way and you don't necessarily have to stitch with the called for. So I came up with 10 different color combinations. I didn't plan to do this uh, in this way, but I ended up with five bright color combinations and five neutral color combinations as well as five groups of two colors and five groups of three colors. <laughs> Anyways, I'm just gonna start with the brights. So the first one that I want to show is this group of three. This is very bright and actually <laughs> I was trying to think last night of ways to describe these color combinations. So this is the pink is pink 182 which is a very, very fun and loud pink. I've used this before in a conversion. I really like this. Also, 10 out of 10 name, Pink 182. I'm all for it. This one is Matcha. So that's a very bright, um, it's not neon, but it's, it's heading in that direction. <laughs> and it is uh, a bluey green. And then the last one is turmeric. I got a few skeins of this, and this is a gorgeous, gorgeous color. I mean, it is, I mean, it's the color of turmeric, so I don't really need to describe it in a lot of words. If you know what turmeric looks like, that's what this is. But this is beautiful. I mean, this would work also in a, in a more neutral palette if you wanted something punchy. It looks so uh, luxurious. It's a gorgeous color. I got a few skeins of it, which I'm really happy about. Um, I, I would also love to stitch a monochromatic piece with this on a darker colored linen so it can really shine. Anyway, so I was thinking the way that I thought of describing this is like these are like funfetti cake colors but with, you know, gold leaf in the frosting. Like it's just a little bit more expensive than your than your regular fun fetty cake. <laughs> anyway, so these are, I, I probably wouldn't want to stitch a whole piece in this just because I, I, I prefer the neutrals over the brights, but I know a lot of people I think would really like this color combination. Very bright, very pretty, very happy. A uh, slightly different but similar color combination is fuzzy peach. That's this color, this kind of, well, peachy color. And then Spade. And Spade is very similar to Matcha, but it is a little bit less saturated uh, and a little bit lighter. And so this is a similar color palette, but a bit softer. I really like Fuzzy Peach. It's very, um, I find it to be a very comforting color. 
And so this could be a two colors if you wanted to do, you know, this would, the, the 2024 stitch along could look beautiful in that. Last year's stitch along could look beautiful in that. Um, but again, it's very bright. So I, I probably, you know, wouldn't be something that I would gravitate towards, but I would maybe do like a small with something like this. Anyway, so that's my second color combination that I wanted to show. And then my third, which once again includes pink. One, two, three, four, five, six of my 10 color combinations have a pink in them. I don't know, it's 2023, it's the year of the Barbie, why not? So this is a whole bunch of pink. These are, this is once again, pink 182. This is a used up skein, so that's why it looks skinnier. Um, Florida pink, which I've also used in a conversion, and jeté, which is a very, very pale pink. And this is quite, there's like a nice, it's a dark, a medium, and a light pink. And my next color combination is actually very similar to this, uh, but this is sort of the louder version of the two. And yeah, these worked beautifully in my conversion that I, that I used them for. And yeah, I remember looking at all three of them in that conversion and thinking, Oh, those look so pretty together. <laughs> They're quite nice. So if you're a pink gal or you're doing a, an homage to the Barbie movie, well, look no further. Jeté, Florida Pink, and Pink 182. She's a winner. Okay, and then the next color combination, I'm actually going to hold them all up at the same time, is very similar, but it's kind of the more, it's the quieter version. So my darker pink isn't as dark, and my lighter pink is a little bit darker. So there's less contrast. So I'll put this other one down now. So the medium pink is again Florida pink. So I kept that the same, but the darker pink is flamingo and the lighter pink is tickled pink. And those are two new ones that I picked up. I really did buy a lot of pink floss in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> I don't know what's come over me. Anyways, so these are quite... I'm quite drawn to these three together. They're beautiful. And I think that there's still more than enough contrast between them that you could stitch a monochromatic piece in your, in your own way and, and include multiple colors. So that's that. And then my last, my last bright color combination that I wanted to show is this one. And this is called Perry. And the lighter one is called Polar Ice. And again, I use these in a conversion. I mostly pulled from Stash for these, but they complement each other so beautifully. And this is kind of a, a periwinkle uh, color combination. Very soft. I mean, they're brighter colors, but it's it's not uh, it's it's not very loud at all. These colors are super sweet together, and um, there's something a little bit nostalgic about these colors. This is my blue selection to offset the pink selection. These are really pretty. These are really pretty colors. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into the neutrals and I'm actually, I'm more excited about the neutrals than I am the brights because as much as I like bright colors, I don't like a bunch of bright colors together. I like it when they're used in a very uh, sporadic and strategic way. <laughs> anyway, so the first combination of neutrals that I I was quite surprised by it. So a lot of these color combinations that I came up with, I knew exactly what to pick out uh, when I saw the the ensemble of flosses that I that I own. Uh, but then after I picked out a bunch, I started just experimenting with does this look good with this? Does this look look good with that? And this was one that I I came up with that I was quite surprised by. So this is Morganite, and this was one of the ones that was on promotion. Uh, a floss that I hadn't really heard of and it's really really nice it's gorgeous it's a uh, kind of a peachy pale pink I'd still say that this is more pink than it is peach uh, but it's like kind of a fleshy color and it's super beautiful easy on the eyes um, kind of understated Anyways, and then the second one, the lighter of the greens, is arugula, which is a very neutral green that I feel like would look good with just about anything. 
so those two look beautiful, just the two of them. And then the last one is Dirty Martini, and I talked about this one. Dirty Martini is a very complex color, and it probably doesn't look that interesting in video. But in real life, this green has browns in it, it has reds in it, it is very warm, but it also feels kind of gray and unsaturated. I have such a hard time describing this color. It's very complex, but it looks great with arugula. And there's plenty of contrast between those two. Uh, but then morganite also just makes it, it... The morganite is really the star in these two. I feel like the greens end up being the backdrop and the morganite is is the what sings on a top of the greens just neutral but alive anyways i really like that color combination i i was quite uh surprised it was unexpected to me okay <laughs> the next one uh this is one of my favorites that i came up with i am calling this the katie strachan combo <laughs> and hear me out okay I was talking about Katie Strachan earlier. Um, so if you watch her videos, you know that she is a green gal. She's all about the greens. She's constantly pulling out all of her green silks and talking about how gorgeous they are. And they are gorgeous. And I feel like spinach, this green, is a color that she would really like. And if you watched my last video, you know what this means. This is pretty much a full skein of spinach. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say about that. Anyways. It's uh, a very aptly named floss. This to me looks like the color of spinach once you've cooked it. And uh, I used it in a sampler that I finished uh, about a month ago. And I feel like this is a color that Katie would really like. I know that she mm, seems to mostly stitch with silks, so this is a cotton, but you know, Katie, if you're watching this, you might like spinach by Roxy Floss. <laughs> and then the second color, is what I would call the color of Katie's hair, <laughs> which maybe makes me sound really creepy that I'm talking about somebody's hair. But Katie's dragon has like the prettiest orange hair and this floss is called Nobel. And don't these colors look beautiful together? Even if you remove the Katie Strachan reference, these two colors are beautiful together. They look so luxurious and expensive. This is a, uh, it's a little bit on the darker side, so I would choose a light colored linen for this. Uh, but yeah, these are, these are beautiful, beautiful colors. Nobel is just, it's golden, it's rich, it sparkles. I love, 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 love those two colors together. I picked those out right away. Even, I, even when I bought, I had spinach in my stash already. Nobel was one that I had bought, but when I saw Nobel, I was like, Spinach, that's gonna look good with spinach. <laughs> so the next one, and this is another color combination um, that was kind of surprising to me. Uh, I, this was one of the last ones I came up with and I, I was just playing around with colors and, and discovered that this one looked good. So I have a very dark color here, so I'm gonna put this on, on a piece of linen so you can see it a little bit better. But this is, the red is Falu Red, which is my favorite red in the Roxy line. And the darker color is green and Barrett, so it probably looks black, but actually it's a very, 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 very dark green. So this is a green and a red, but it's not at all Christmassy. Um, this is a very stately, um, very stately color combination. And boy, do they look beautiful together. They're strong colors, they're bold, they're dark. This is a dark, a very dark red. Um, I find it quite hard to photograph this red because it always shows up. It has so much depth of color that it, it's hard to actually see the red. I feel like I see the shadows more than I see the red. But in real life, this is a stately, a stately red. And Green and Barrett is one I feel also a very interesting color to me because it's so dark that at first glance it looks black but it's actually green. Anyways, so it's a red and a green, but it, you see these colors together and it's not like a, it doesn't scream Christmas at all, at all. It, um, to me, it's like more gothic. <laughs> uh, I, I like these colors a lot together. I was surprised by that. I have stitched 
um, Falu Red with chalkboard before, and I was actually thinking of including that, but I actually prefer, I prefer it with Green and Barrett. I think they, they really flatter each other. They complement each other. A really, really nice color combination. Uh, the next one, if you wanted to go a bit, uh, a bit more grayscale, I found, well, I'll get rid of this now, but I found that Fulanda, which is a very, very dark greenish brown with Countess, which is a gray. They look quite nice together. Oh, actually, I am going to take this again. So those look really pretty together. Um, maybe if you wanted to include a brighter color, it would, it would look good as a trio. That's a really pretty color combination. Another neutral that might be interesting to somebody out there if you really don't want to have a bunch of colors screaming at you while you stitch. And the last color combination actually leads me to the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which is my plans, because I am going to use this color combination for my next project ah, that I'm going to start very soon. So this trio of colors is so beautiful. So I've talked about two of these colors before. This pale blue is powdered up. The darker blue is Goody Blue Shoes, which was one that I kind of accidentally bought at the retreat, but absolutely fell in love with. And this pink is called Cherry Blossom. And it was day four in the holiday countdown. And I did, as I mentioned, I didn't actually get the flosses, but at the end of every week, they sell what they have left from the holiday countdown. And when I saw people stitching with Cherry Blossom, I was so jealous because this is the most perfect pink ever. It's, it's not a, like a super understated pink. Like if I were to compare it to um, Morganite, for example, Morganite is, is this one here. And this is much less bright. It's a lot uh, more understated, and it's maybe a little bit peachier. But then the cherry blossom, like it's, it's bright, it's very visible, it doesn't hide at all, but it's really not in your face. Like, you know, pink 182 is, this is a loud pink, that's a real Barbie pink. But this is still plenty bright, but it's like, I don't think I would ever get sick of looking at this color. And I went through all of the pink flosses that I have, even in other lines uh, outside of Roxy floss. And this is my favorite pink floss that I have ever laid my eyes on. So I am really, really crossing my fingers that this enters the permanent line. I hope it's not a limited edition because it's so pretty. And if you look at it with these two flosses, these two blues that I already recognize as being perfect for one another, the three of them together, oh my goodness. It, these colors were made for each other. So the next project that I am going to be working on, and this is the project that I'm going to work on when I go home for the holidays, and I'm going to be stitching on trains while I travel and in not necessarily good light, so I'm going to be talking a little bit of, about why I've made the choices that I've made. But anyways, the next project I'm going to be working on is... Again, a modern folk embroidery, <laughs> which is not a bad thing. It's great, but I'm starting to realize like, okay, if I'm going to be making floss tubes, like people don't want me to just talk about one designer because it's going to make it sound like it's a paid ad or something. It's not. I genuinely really <laughs> like everything that I'm stitching. But anyways, uh, I talked about this a little bit in my last video, but my next project is going to be Quilter's Dream by Modern Folk Embroidery. It is a new design of his, and I'm going to work on this while I'm home for the holidays. And it's a design that calls for two colors, and I thought I would probably stitch it with these two blues, but once I saw this pink, I was like, well, I need to, I need to include the pink somehow. So for the dark color in the chart, I'm going to use Goody Blue Shoes, and then I'm going to use both of these other colors, so Powdered Up and Cherry Blossom. For the the light color that the chart calls for and i originally i bought both of these linens thinking that i might use probably catnap for it 
and I think these colors look super gorgeous on there. But I mentioned that this gray is kind of a medium color, medium tone. It's, it's not super light. It's not super dark either, but it's not uh, something that I necessarily would want to be stitching on in low light or on a train. And especially since it's 46 count, it might be quite difficult. But actually what I had in mind well, before I looked at the linens that they had available was something that was a bit more the color of a biscuit. And I, when I did a floss toss, I thought that the colors maybe looked nicer on catnap, but I actually did something I've never done before, which is that I stitched a swatch on both linens and all three colors look really, really nice on biscuit. I thought the pink might not, but actually it looks really nice, especially in comparison, sorry, in combination with the two blues. So I will save catnap for another day. Also, this is a paler linen, so I feel like I'll be able to see it a little bit better. We'll see. Hopefully I'm not suffering the whole time that I'm traveling, unable to find any of the holes. I don't use any kind of magnification. I have a really nice light that I enjoy, but I won't have the light with me. So we'll see how it goes. But I think, it, I think it'll be fine. I might be stitching a little bit slower than I do at home, but that is what I'm going to be stitching on. Yes, that's going to be very, very fun to work on. I think that those colors, I don't think I'm ever going to get tired of looking at these colors. They're so gorgeous. <laughs> They're so gorgeous. Anyways, so that's my plan for the holidays, which means that between the months of October and December, I will have stitched one designer only. So that's another one of my goals for 2024. <laughs> is that I would like to uh, broaden my horizons and not just stitch modern folk embroidery. Actually, you'll see when I do my uh, finish parade that I stitched a lot of stuff from other designers. It's really just since I came back from the retreat that I, you know, have been sick with uh, modern folk embroidery fever and I haven't quite recovered yet. <laughs> it's okay. It's a fun fever. I'm, I'm into it. All right, what was the next thing I want to talk about? Oh yes, okay, so that's kind of my haul from Evertote. I did get a few other flosses, but I don't want to bore you with a million different flosses. So I'm just going to move on. Uh, the next uh, piece of haul that I got came from Kitten Stitcher. So during Cyber Week, or maybe it was on Black Friday actually, I think, uh, somebody who follows me on Instagram, Desiree, reached out to me and was like, hey, you need to check out Kitten Stitcher's website. She has a great sale going on. And I'd heard of this name before. I would heard Flosstubers mention them, but I never actually shopped there before. And yes, they did have a really good sale going on. And so I've mentioned already that I would like to learn how to finish things. But I mean, when you're stitching something like this that has stitching on the front and the back, it's, you, you, you can just use linen in the front and the back. But if I wanted to do a pillow or a drum where not all of the pieces are stitched, I need fabric for that, right? And I guess I could use just linen with nothing stitched on it, but that's kind of boring. So I decided that I needed some fabric and I don't know how to sew. I'm not a quilter or a seamstress, so I don't really know that I bought the right thing, but I got two bundles of, fabric and they're so pretty i really hope i use these because i'm gonna feel really silly owning these if i'm not actually <laughs> gonna use them but anyways uh the blue pack i don't i heard people on floss tube talking about these brands so i guess they're good i don't know but they're certainly pretty so this is moda bleu de france so blue from france and it's a whole bunch of blues and I have a whole bunch of blue uh, books, books with a bunch of things stitched in blue that would need finishing. So I feel like this is a really good pack. And also there's some neutrals in there too. And I really love blue. I mean, I love all colors, come on. Color is great. And I have not taken it out of its little wrapping because it's so pretty. And I know that I would not be able to make it look as pretty again afterwards. So I've just been like taking a peek at all of the corners and like, oh, look at that one. Oh, how about that? <laughs> oh, this one doesn't have any pattern on it at all. Wow. Anyway, so maybe one day I will 
just bite the bullet and untie this little ribbon and actually have a look at all of these. Uh, but for now, I'm going to keep them pretty like this, all cozy wrapped up together. And, and those are eighths, eighth of a yard. And these are also eighth of a yard. And this is Blackbird, Threads That Bind by Moda as well. And here it has a, there's a bit more variety in color, but I feel like these are, are really good for finishing as well. And from what I can see, when I peek through the corner, they look very beautiful and very versatile too. And I know that Blackbird fabric is highly sought after. So now I have some and I'm happy to have it. This is beautiful. So those are the fabrics I picked up. And speaking of things that will need finishing, I got a bunch of patterns, uh, and this first one definitely has some, some smalls that would need some fabric. Um, I decided to just go through only the part of the website that had things on sale. So everything I bought was on sale, and with the exception of one pattern, these are all patterns that I was planning on buying. So it was a very good deal for me. So thank you, Desiree, for sending me uh, over to kitten stitchers website anyway so the first one is Yuli Hold Freud uh, by Sudi Day this is a designer I'm really excited about I talked quite extensively about Sudi Day's other book uh, with sampler in it GH 1857 which I plan on stitching which also has a bunch of, of smalls that will be finished and have a lot of blue and that that blue fabric is gonna be perfect for it but hey guess what this one also has a bunch of finished small finishes, small things that will need to be finished that are also blue. So blue is kind of, I know 2023 was the year of the Barbie, but maybe 2024 is the year of, what's blue? I don't know. Avatar. <laughs> I think Avatar is, is done, right? I don't know, whatever. I've never actually seen those movies. But yes, blue. Blue, blue, blue. It's another sampler that was on my, you know, two stitch list. So I got that. And the only thing that I bought that I was a sampler that I actually had never heard of, uh, but I saw it and I really liked it and I liked the idea of it, uh, is this heartstring samplery. Uh, it's called A Ship for Mary. And I find this really interesting because, well, the picture is kind of small, but you can see there it says a ship and at the very bottom it says a present to Mary Sim and there's a little bit of information on the back but the information is basically there's no identifying information on this so there's no way we can figure out who stitched it. All we can really definitely say is that this was a gift to somebody whose name was Mary Sim and who maybe had an affinity for boats. I like to imagine that maybe Mary Sim was moving away and that she would be traveling on a boat to wherever she was going and that her very dear friend gave this to her as a parting gift and you know the sampler survived so it must have meant something to Mary because she held on to it and I guess her kids or her friends or somebody held on to it for a while and then eventually it ended up with uh, was it Beth Twist right yes Beth Twist anyway I, I think that's beautiful red flowers can't go wrong boats can't go wrong I like how that central flower has the streak of a different a different color. I guess they ran out of floss or something. But I like that. It gives it kind of a patchwork feel. And uh it's it's a fun one because it makes you imagine like who how much I mean the stitcher must have really loved Mary Sim, right? So this might be a really nice thing to stitch and then gift to a friend that I really love, you know? Anyways, so I'm looking forward to working on that one and I'm glad that I discovered it and that it happened to be on sale. <laughs> uh, then I got two hands across the sheet charts that I, again, uh, was planning on buying at some point. So this is Rachel Sh Sheard. I don't know exactly how to say that. Rachel, aged 82. That is really the part of this sampler that I find interesting that she was 82 because it's quite unusual to find a sampler that is stitched by an older woman. They tend to be, you know, 12 years or younger. <laughs> so that's, I, I like to, again, this makes me just wonder, I, well, I know that uh, Nicola does a lot of research and there's a couple pages of information here that I haven't read yet. So maybe we will know uh, why she stitched this at that age. But I kind of like to imagine that, you know, 
maybe she was really busy and finally at the age of 82 she finally had enough time to just sit down and stitch her sampler and uh yeah it's it's uh i like the the green is very bright i'm curious to see what what colors end up getting chosen for this it's uh it's quite unique i'm i'm really happy to have this in my collection because i think that this is also something worth preserving and we tend to valorize youth but this is a great reminder that even as you get older you can still make really beautiful things and be creative and contribute and you know way to go rachel you did it so that's that and then the other hands across the sea is one <laughs> i could not believe that this was on sale anyway so this is maria vincenza la riccia or la rica I can never remember. This is bad because I'm Italian, so I should know how to pronounce that. But yes, this big whopper of a chart. And I love this about Hands Across the Sea, that they, they have the big centerfold. There's a lot of glare on that. But anyways, it's fun to see a nice big picture of it. Really high quality. And also, like, it's just printed out so large. <laughs> so it's going to be fun, fun and easy to stitch when I get to it. And... um yeah, so I have talked a lot in my past videos about how I'm Dutch and that a lot of my stitching is of D Dutch samplers and it makes me feel connected to my heritage and all of that stuff. But I mustn't forget that I am only half Dutch and my other half is Italian. And Hands Across the Sea has a few Italian samplers that are really gorgeous. So I would like to stitch this one day too. Kind of acknowledge the needleworking traditions on the other side of my family too. And this is very big, but it's it's sparsely stitched. So I, you know, I'm not going to say that this would come together quickly, but it's certainly a lot less stitching than my big Firlanda. This is very densely stitched. So so I don't think it would be as huge of an undertaking as the Firlanda. But yes, very gorgeous. So the next thing I bought was and this like I was like, okay, Okay, you're basically giving this away for free. This was on sale for five bucks. A blackbird for five dollars? What? Anyways, this is one that I, again, intended on buying. So I was like, well, might as well get it. It's five dollars. What remains is love. A really pretty one. This was, I think this was for a while. It was an exclusive with traditional stitches and now it's uh, widely available. Ooh, what do you know? I have a lot of these flosses in stash. Hmm. Anyways, very pretty. Uh, very, very pretty. I love the border. I like that the bottom border is different. <laughs> like the little rows of, of, of birds. Anyways, it's a nice one. So there was that. And then the very last thing that I got from Kitten Stitcher, and this was funny because I had just recorded my last video where I said that I intended on stitching this and making a conversion. I didn't own the chart yet, but uh, I, I did intend on stitching it. And well, here you go. <laughs> this is Teresa Kogut's Strawberry Manor. And this is actually the first pattern of hers that I own. I'm surprised that I came this far without actually owning any of her patterns. And yeah, this is one that I would like to convert to Roxy Floss. And I'm so excited to stitch this because again, it's, it's printed so big, like it's, Oh man, I don't want to say that it's an easy stitch without having actually stitched it yet, but having a big, big chart like this blown up so nice, it definitely makes the stitching experience uh, that much easier. And it's also printed in color. And I know that that, like, that costs a lot more to do, so really beautifully put together. And I'm looking forward to stitching this in the spring or the summer of next year. It's definitely something that I would like to do. Okay, and then the last place that I bought from that I wanted to show, and I'm quite excited about this, is from a new shop on Etsy, a new dyer of floss and linen, actually. She also has some linen. Uh, I didn't get any, but she does also have some linen. Uh, the shop, as well as the floss tuber, is called Vera Stitching Spot, and she has started dyeing naturally dyed flosses and linens. So I think this is super, super interesting. I just got this yesterday, which is why I held off on, on filming because I wanted to show it. Um, and yeah, so, and everything is named after 
what it is dyed with. So these pinks are Rubia. One of them is Reserved Rubia, one is Coral Rubia. Again, more pink floss, what do you know? So this is Pale Oak. I feel like this is really like a coconut meat color. This one is Overcast Tea, so she's also dyeing with teas. And I really, really like this color. This color, it's like a purpley, silvery gray, very pale but a really nice color. Um, burnished Walnut, which is a gray, a grayer color. It's a very warm gray. It's getting washed out a bit in the light. Um, cloudy Chestnut, so a warmer, a warmer uh, brown, pale as well. Gold Pomegranate, this is interesting because I would not expect pomegranate to yield this kind of color. But yeah, that's kind of yellowy. Very pretty. This is the deepest color that I have. Deep Acacia. A brown, kind of a peachy brown. Interesting color. And then two Rubias. So this is a slightly variegated, a cooler pink, a little bit lighter than the other one, Reserved Rubia. And then the brighter pink is called Coral Rubia. And yeah, it's a bit more coral in color, a little bit brighter. And in general, they are pretty pale colors. So I feel like these would be really cool for smalls on dark fabric, because then if they do fade, it doesn't really matter because there's already quite a bit of contrast. So I can see these stitched on, like for example, what is it called? Night Owl, I think is a, a deep blue by Roxy Floss. And, you know, stitching some, some smalls on Night Owl with one of these colors and then you know there's a lot of contrast maybe make a little pin cushion or something anyways i just think this is really cool i think it's a really interesting thing that she's doing and a really exciting new new dyer to check out so check her out <laughs> so that's the last bit of haul that i wanted to share so now i'm going to announce the salve that i have planned I sort of hinted at this, and first of all, I need to give a big shout out to Somi Sarah because this was 100% her idea. She suggested it maybe as a kind of passing comment, but you know, now it's turned into a real thing. So Sarah, thank you. Um, she also said that she'd participate and she's doing a project next year where she is doing 50 new starts. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so maybe one of these 50 starts will be her her contribution to the cell so it's going to be called hashtag jacob sleeper cell and basically the idea is to take a or to choose a chart of jacobs that you don't often see stitched and to stitch it and it's a running cell there's no like start and end date you just i i'm gonna start mine tentatively march 1st because that gives me a bit of time to gather all my materials and Finally is all the details and also if people want to join me that also gives you some time to do that. Uh, but yeah, there are, Jacob has a huge uh, body of work that you can choose from. There's a lot of things that I feel like people kind of forget exist. <laughs> and uh, I talked about this in my very first video that uh, when I was at the retreat, I saw his stitched model of Charlotte Ramsey and that this was a chart that I had never come across at all. Didn't know it existed, but I absolutely fell in love with it. I'll have the picture of that on screen right now. And so that's what I'm going to choose. And of course, if you want to join, you're welcome to do that too. I plan on early in the new year, reaching out to Evertote and having, I'm assuming probably Hannah make a conversion for me. And you're welcome to do that too if you wish, but there are certainly tons of other patterns of his that you could choose from. And I thought that it would be nice if every video that I make from now until March 1st, whenever I start, that I find a couple of charts uh, from his website that might be interesting for some of you to choose. So of course, the first one I'm gonna shout out is Charlotte Ramsey, that's the one I'm gonna be doing. Um, and the second one is actually going to be something that I have stitched right here twice that I've already shown you. I have seen this stitched one other time. I mean, I've stitched it four times, but by somebody else one other time. It was, I noticed that uh, somebody also 
stitch this in the smalls exchange. And I, I'm not at all suggesting that only two people in the world have stitched this. I'm sure plenty of people have, but I just, I don't see it stitched online very much. And you know, it's not huge. It is quite densely stitched. And if you want to have it fully finished, then you have to know how to do a biscornu, but there are video tutorials online that teach you how to do that. I mean, that's how I learned how to do it. And I had zero experience at the time. So if I can do it, you can do it. So that's an idea for somebody who maybe wants to stitch something a little bit smaller. And the last one, ooh, I was gonna bring it out, but I forgot. One second, let me get that. Okay, I'm back. Uh, the other one that I wanted to suggest was this one. This is the Swedish Folk Cushion. And this is one that I brought to the retreat and quite a few people were interested in stitching it who hadn't seen it before. So I thought that would be another good one to show. And I loved stitching this so much stitched in a quadrant with the exception of the center motif. And actually when I was looking for, because I always forget the name of this chart. So I went on the website and I, in his search function, I just wrote the word Swedish because I knew it had Swedish in it. And I found all sorts of other charts that are Swedish that I'd never seen before. And some of them are really small. So if you don't want to have to start a huge, enormous thing, you can choose one of those. And I think generally how things show up on his website is that the newer things show up first and then you kind of have to scroll through the other pages to find his uh, older works that are maybe more forgotten. So I would just suggest going through or maybe even doing what I did there where you just search the word Swedish if you want to stitch something Swedish. <laughs> so those are my three suggestions for today. So now I'm going to talk about the very last segment that I have planned in this video, which is going to include me just kind of telling the story of how I got back into stitching and then showing my finishes from before. And a lot of this is stuff that I wouldn't necessarily be inclined to stitch today, but it tells the story of how I got here. So I feel like it's, it's useful for me to kind of keep a record of this. So I'm making this for myself, but of course you're welcome to stay and listen to this story and see some of my previous finishes from the last, well, from, from last year, really mostly. So I learned to stitch as a child and then I stopped for many years. I know that this is kind of a common thing, you know, as a teenager, I was too cool for cross stitch. I was busy, you know, doing teenager things. So I, <laughs> I stopped stitching for a long time and then in the summer of 2021, so just over two years ago, I was really, really interested in a lot of beaders from mostly from Canada. Uh, so native people who make a lot of beaded products. It got me thinking because a lot of the design, I found it to be very familiar to me. But really the main thing that made me think of cross stitching was that I mean, with beading, you're creating a larger image out of these tiny little units. And it's the exact same thing with cross stitch. The only difference is that with beading, those units are beads and with cross stitch, those units are small stitched X's. And so I just, I, I, I was seeing this online, really interested in it and was like, well, I kind of know how to do that. I mean, not that exactly, but something that resembles that in a way yet ties me to my own culture and my own history and my own family history. So that's really what planted this seed of maybe I should get back into cross stitch. So I had a Zoom call with my aunt that summer and I just kind of wanted to pick her brain about cross stitching because she's the one who taught me to cross stitch as a child. So I, I figured she was the authority if I had questions. And we had a Zoom call and we geeked out over it and she explained to me a little bit about her story of how she started cross stitching. And then she sent me in the mail a big craft dinner box, like, like you know, a 16 pack of craft dinner, but instead of macaroni and cheese, it's full of cross stitch supplies. And she gifted me a whole bunch of DMC floss that had belonged to the person who taught her how to stitch. So I kind of inherited this really old DMC that I sometimes use, if I, but I use it sparingly because it's kind of precious to me, but but I do have, I do have it. And she also sent me a whole bunch of vintage magazines from the nineties. And she, in that kit, in that box, she had gifted me a kit. 
uh, that she had held on to and never used. So this ended up being my very first project back after at least 15 years. And it's a Mill Hill kit and I was looking at it last night and it says buttoned and beaded kit. So I'm pretty sure these are now called buttons and beads, but this was from 1995. <laughs> so I'm gonna guess that it's probably not available anymore. House on the Hill, Spring 3 Mill Hill. And yeah, this is the very first thing that I made after 15 years away. And I had so much fun doing this and did this in the summer of 2021. And there's a lot of specialty stitches in there. I'm kind of surprised that I was able to do all of that. A lot of beads, of course. And I finished it, I, I ended up doing a running stitch and I sewed a piece of felt to it and this little hanger I did just did some big X's over the perforated paper. You can see all that in the back. <laughs> and this hangs in my studio. And you know, it's not at all something I would be inclined to, to spend a lot of time stitching now, but it's my first piece back. So it's kind of, it's kind of important for me to hold on to this. And then the only other thing I stitched in 2021 was right before Christmas, I thought it would be a nice idea to stitch an ornament for all of my colleagues. I was talking in the beginning of the video about this one. So that was the picture I will put up on screen was the first iteration of that ornament. And that design came from one of the magazines that my aunt gave me. And I think I made eight of them that year or something like that. And that was all I stitched in 2021. And I didn't stitch again for one year. So it was really just a taste back into cross stitching, but I hadn't, you know, fully immersed myself in it. So fast forward a year, which is pretty much a year ago now, and it's October of 2022, and I am thinking again that I would like to make ornaments for all of my colleagues. And without getting into too much detail, unfortunately, in this moment in my life, there was a bunch of kind of difficult things happening all at once. And it was a very, it was kind of, I was, I was just like a little bit blue and a little bit stressed out and it was just, you know, sometimes there's a season of life that's a little bit more difficult. Don't worry, I'm fine. But I, I needed something that was comforting and I'm sure you can see where this is going. So it's happened to coincide with when I realized that I should probably start stitching these ornaments and I started them in October because the previous year I did them all like the week before I had to give them away and it was just like a lot of stitching all at once especially since I hadn't been stitching in over a decade. Um, so I decided to start a little bit earlier. So the first thing I stitched back after my long hiatus was this little ornament, which ended up being like my first prototype for the ornaments that I ended up giving away. I didn't give this, I, I ended up making a version that was slightly bigger. This was my second prototype, which I actually finished in the way that I finished the ones that I gave away. Uh, there are a bunch of mistakes in here, and I also, um, once again, it's, it's too small, but it gives you an idea of how I finished it. I just attached this bead that kind of acted as a star on top of the tree. And again, this is not like my finest work, but it is like this ornament I stitched one day. And since that day, there have maybe been maybe 10 days since this ornament was stitched that I did not stitch. And that was only because I had like, you know, 12 hour work days and didn't have time. So I pretty much have stitched every single day since this was stitched. So that's why this tiny little piece matters to me because it was the beginning of a long adventure that is still ongoing. <laughs> And I, uh, I will insert a picture of what the final ornament ended up being. I don't have them anymore because I already gave them away a year ago. But I did manage to find some pictures. And then I went into the magazines that my aunt gave me because I was like, I'm really, really enjoying this and I think I can do this for 12 hours a day. <laughs> and that's kind of still how I feel about it. Anyways, so one of the magazines, and I've stitched quite a bit from this magazine. I stitched a lot from it last year. Sorry about that, somebody is honking their horn outside. This is a Better Homes and Gardens Cross Stitch Christmas Special Edition from 1994. There was a set of three little animals 
ornaments made for a card uh, that I ended up stitching. And I, well, at first I just started with this one because I really liked it. And I, I have the other two because I ended up stitching all three of them. I can't find the bunny one anywhere. I have no idea how it got separated from the other two. I'm sure it's in my house somewhere, but anyways, I did find fortunately on my phone a picture that I'd taken of it. So I'll put that on screen, but that was the first like pattern that I followed um, that year. And the first thing from this magazine that I stitched. And then after I finished that, I stitched the other two. So we got some dogs and some cats and the bunnies. Well, hopefully they turn up eventually, but right now I'm not, not totally sure where they are. Anyways, so I stitched those and I didn't realize that back stitching you're only supposed to use one thread. So I used two, <laughs> oops, whatever. Back stitches are very prominent. And this is just on 14 count Ada that I had. Um, lying around and also I didn't use the called four colors I just went into the stash of of uh bobbinated DMC that my aunt had given me I I just remember how much comfort I got I was so stressed out at the time but then I stitched this and this was very <sighs> calming for me and even though they, they aren't stitched with the materials or it's not a design that I'm really drawn to I, I, I feel that sense of calm again when I look at these pieces. And then I wanted to stitch something big and big for me was probably, uh, well, what I considered big at the time was, it's not what I consider big anymore. So then I stitched this, which also came from that magazine and is also stitched on Ada. And this was a piece of Ada that was folded up for like, you know, 20 years. And it doesn't matter how many times I iron this, but those folds are not gonna come out. <laughs> And it again came from the same magazine. It was this design, which to me, this is very, um, reminds me of Prairie Schooler charts. Uh, I've never actually stitched a Prairie Schooler, I'd love to. And the designer is Carol Rogers. And I Googled her yesterday and I couldn't really find anything about her. So I don't know if she's still designing, if she's still out there, but. I really like this. I think still today this is, I mean, the back stitching dates it a little bit, but other than that, I think it's it's still a very, um, a very uh, tasteful design still today. So I stitched that last year. And again, that was, oh, this I actually stitched with all the called for. Cause I was like, well, I, I have to stitch with the called for, otherwise it won't be right. Cause I, I just stitched these with whatever I had lying around. Now I, I know better now, you don't need to stitch with the called for, but this technically is the called for in case you're, in case you're interested. And yeah, it's like super cute, super, super cute. The next thing I stitched, I decided I wanted to make an ornament for my parents. So I don't have this anymore because I already gifted it to them, but I still have the package and it's one of these Mill Hills and I have a picture of the finished thing and this thing is beautiful. I know Mill Hill kits are, you know, they're kind of involved. But the little ornaments, when they're done, with all of those beads and everything, they're so pretty. They're so pretty. They're really finicky to stitch, but the final product is gorgeous. And I, you know, when I go home for Christmas, I will see that ornament on the tree again. And uh, luckily I took a picture, so that'll, that'll be on screen. That was the next thing I stitched. I felt really good about that one because I was like, oh, this is so pretty. I don't want to give it away. But yeah, the reason I chose it is because it has a little white dog on it that looks just like my parents' dog, Lily. <laughs> so that's why I chose that one for them. And then uh, the next thing I stitched was my first modern folk embroidery piece. And I talked about this a little bit uh, in my very first video, but I basically discovered modern folk embroidery through discovering floss tube because I, you know, when I started stitching again, I was convinced that there was some kind of online community where cross stitching was being spoken of. <laughs> I just, you know, I've been on the internet long enough to know that there's a little niche group of people for every different craft and hobby that you can think of. So I sought out floss tube before I really knew what floss tube even was. 
and that's how I discovered Flosstube and then you know Jacob was recommended in one of the videos and I went to his website and immediately like my jaw hit the floor and the first thing I stitched of his was his Hanseatic pin pillow which is not the third time that I'm talking about this however this was not the first iteration of this pillow that I made the first one I made ended up being a gift for a friend and I'll include some photo of that and again at that time I was I was just using the materials that I had so I stitched it on Ada uh, with I think I used 815 DMC and then I ran out so I had to use a, a dark gray that I also had in stash for the bottom part and uh, yeah and then I gave that away but I wasn't able to figure out how to I well I didn't have a sharp enough needle to pierce through so in my second iteration I, I kind of stuffed it halfway and then I stitched the one stitch that connects the middles and then I st stuffed it the other half and that's what I've done every time since but that first time I had already like sealed it all off and I wanted to punch a hole through the middle but I didn't but I wasn't able to get through it by the way I stuff my pin cushions with cotton balls that I buy at the drugstore <laughs> I just kind of shred them up so it's not lumpy <laughs> it's like maybe not the best way to stitch things I also find that my pins and needles don't really go through very well there's like too much friction anyways so maybe if i used a different material i would have been able to pierce through but anyway so that was the the first modern folk embroidery piece that i'd ever stitched and the first pin cushion that i'd ever made didn't quite manage to turn it into a biscornu but now when i think about it i'm like oh, i can't believe i gave that away as a gift like it was so unfinished and ratty but she seemed to be happy with it and I was thrilled with it at the time. <laughs> um, and then the next thing that I stitched again, I mean, at this point, I'm already down the rabbit hole of, of modern folk embroidery. So I stitched uh, Winter Birds, a Christmas pincushion, and I've actually stitched this twice. The, this is the first time I stitched it, which is again on 14 count oatmeal Ada. And I just like, I sewed it together. I folded it up and I sewed it in. That's how I did it, which in hindsight, I'm not happy with that decision because look, the birds are kind of the stars of the shows on this pattern. But the, if you do it this way, they end up getting kind of jammed in the corner. And so when you look at it from the top or the bottom, you don't see the birds at all. You only see the birds if you look at it like this and you can barely even discern that those are birds. Anyways, uh, so I wouldn't recommend finishing it if this way but anyways I have it and you know I kind of I like this kind of finish though because it's really a pillow it's co it's comforting to squeeze this in a way that this is not as comforting to squeeze like I can I can sleep on this it's not quite big enough for my big old head but you know in theory um and I've actually stitched this pattern twice so I was stitching one of the things that I have just listed and I was at a bar with some of my friends and they were like, can you make something for me? And at the time I was like, yes, absolutely. And I had no, you know, reservations about that at all. I was like, just give me an excuse to stitch anything. I'll stitch anything for you. So one friend said she wanted something stitched in black on a yellow fabric. And the other one said she wanted a pin cushion that was orange on one side and purple on the other side. So for the girl who wanted the yellow fabric and the black stitching, I stitched again this, um, the winter birds. And I took a piece of Ada and I actually uh, boiled it with turmeric to turn it yellow. <laughs> and I, it worked super well. I don't know if it'll stay yellow for all of time, but yeah. So I, I chose a, a very, very dark gray that I had to stitch it. And I don't have a picture of that one, unfortunately. And then the other girl who wanted the orange and the purple, I stitched for her uh, Quaker Biscornu, again, modern folk embroidery. And I didn't take a picture of it at the time. However, I was at her house when, right when she was moving and I saw it on her shelf. So I, I snuck a picture of it. So I'll, I'll include those pictures here. <laughs> and again, I stitched that on, on Ada with a, an orange and a purple that I happen to have again from my inherited DMC bobbins from you know DMC that's like 30 years old maybe <laughs> so that was uh, an, another thing I stitched in the fall winter of last year and the last thing that I finished in 
in 2022 was this, which I've spoken about a million times in this video. This was my original uh, 32 count um, Hanseatic pin pillow finish. And uh, before the end of the year, I had actually started the AIO 1844 um, sampler, which is my first sampler, which is being given away, but I didn't finish it till 2023. So it doesn't count as one of my previous finishes from 2022. So I, I count the ornaments that I stitched as a gift for my colleagues as one finish, not as 10 finishes. So if you count that as one finish, I, I had 11 finishes from mid-October to the end of December in 2022, which I think just shows how violently the stitchy bug got me. And then finishes started coming a little bit more slowly because I was working on larger projects, but I still have a lot of finishes from the last year that I'm very excited to share in my next video. And I was happy to spend this moment to just share a little bit about the story of how I got here. Anyways, so with that, I'm gonna wrap this video up. I'm gonna, I think I have almost two hours of footage to get through. Can you imagine how long this video would have been if I had done my finished parade in it? Oh goodness, it would have been horrible. Anyways, with that, if you came and stayed until the very end, thank you. So I will be seeing you very, very soon. And if uh, Christmas and all that has happened by then, I wish you very Merry Christmas. I hope you enjoy your stitching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I will be seeing you very, very soon. Bye.